Okay, so, uh, wow, thanks for all the questions during the break. It was uh, amazing and I didn't manage to answer everybody because there was a long line. Uh, feel free to ask me also questions during the talk. And, uh, uh, and there is one, uh, um, I have to answer the question about lock freedom of uh, optimistic access, uh, which I uh, didn't answer in the in the first lecture. So what happens is um, when you um, retire an object, so you, there is a buffer that holds all the objects that has, have been retired. And there is an unlinking property. After you retire an object, no one can get to it all these objects have been retired, unlinked, they're waiting to be reclaimed. Now at some point, the reclaimer comes and he's going to collect all these objects, reclaim them. So um, when he does that, he's going to raise all the flags for all the threads to tell them there is going to be uh, a reclamation now. And he's going to let all the threads start putting objects on a new buffer. So all the things that he's going to reclaim have been unlinked and anyone who is going to redo, restart an operation will never ask, access these. So the true thing is that no one has to wait. So if you, if you see your thing on, then it means that what you've read is bad and you cannot use it. So you just reset your flag, and you go back to the beginning of your routine. After you go back to the beginning of your routine, you will never access these objects that the reclaimer is now reclaiming. So you don't have to wait for the reclaimer. This, is, this was my, uh, the thing I said wrong. You don't have to wait, you just reset your flag, you start from scratch, and you use the next buffer to put all the reclaimed objects. So, lock free is there and everything works correctly. Um, yeah, we, we've managed to, yeah, question. A malicious uh, thread could, could do what? Ah, you're saying if there's a, a malicious reclaimer who goes and mark the bits all the time of all the threads and make everything slow? So, yes, uh, I, I want to remind you, you know, it's, uh, this, this, this data structure is something that you write for yourself. If you want to harm yourself, you don't have to do it so sophisticatedly. You can write a loop, you know, from 1 to 10 to the 10 and just wait on the loop and you say, I mean, malicious things are, are more uh, in case you have some uh, clients coming and, and running different code and trying to install different code on your machine. If you write your own data structures and, you're, and you're, maybe you're not so smart or you want to hurt yourself, you need to go to a psychologist and not, not defend yourself against it in, in the code. Yeah, okay. So, um, fine. So, we, we ran through a lot of material uh, in the first part of the talk and, and I hope it is understandable. I mean, but the questions I saw that many people did understand, but if you do not understand, feel free to stop me and ask me questions and um, we can go slower if you want. Okay, so uh, the second part is about uh, automatic memory reclamation and uh, this is called, um, okay, so uh, what we're uh, going to talk is about garbage collection. What we did until now was not garbage collection. It is always confused in various communities we did manual memory reclamation. We do the allocation. We do the freeing of objects. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about garbage collection. Uh, to do that, uh, I'm going to to do a crash course on garbage collection. Really tell you how it works. I assume you don't know, although maybe you've heard the term. Um, and then the question is, what do we need for garbage collection to support lock freedom? And uh, I'll try to give you state of the art of the techniques that exist, but garbage collection cannot support lock freedom. So right now, if someone 
um, uses garbage collection for their data structures, it's not going to be log free. That's the current thing. Um, so, uh, why do we want garbage collection? Because it's easier, it's a lot easier. You saw how complicated it was to take a data structure and add memory reclamation to it. If we could just use Java, you know, you do new and then you don't have to worry about objects anymore, like you have a garbage collection, takes care of deleting all your objects correctly and properly and in a timely manner. That would be amazing. Um, many designs assume that uh, when you write a paper, you say, I'll use Java and I don't care about reclamation. As I said, it's not good. I mean, even the book does it. It's not going to uh, leave your data structure lock free. On the other hand, it's okay to do this because um, I think, uh, okay, because you want to separate the concerns. You want to solve the algorithm for the data structure separately, and then you want to deal with memory management. So you say, let's let the garbage collection do this. Um, so it is widely used, even in a Java library, you have, if you look at the, at the queue, you look at uh, the skip list, you will find designs that are lock free. And of course, the guys who implemented their in the library know that the garbage collection will not support the log freedom of all these methods, but uh, for them it's not very important. So the log freedom is not the goal, they just want the algorithms to be fast and efficient and scalable. And that still works. If you look in practice, the fact that you let, let a garbage collector come in once in a while, if things are not too large, you know, if you're not Facebook and have this huge data structures, then things are okay with garbage collection. If you are a big company that really needs to look at scalability and at responsiveness, then garbage collection may be wrong and then you want to work on it and make it better. Um, so why do people use garbage collection? So uh, usually, sometimes, but most of the times, log-free data structures operate excellently even if they're not completely lock-free, if the memory management is not lock-free. And this is why it is used in the Java garbage collection. And the other reason you see research papers do this is because it's orthogonal. I mean, you could think separately of designing your data structure and of getting uh, memory reclamation for it. Okay, excellent. So uh, we have a crash course on garbage collections. What is it? Uh, so, first of all, you have some uh, static variables in your code. You, you, in your method, you can say, I have int ijk, I have an array of characters, strings, etc. This is allocated when you enter the routine, a method, when you start executing it, when you finish executing it, it evaporates, there is no, all of these are gone, they're not used anymore. Uh, but many times you need, if you have a large enough program, you need to, and you don't know what we'll need in advance, like if you have a linked list, you want to allocate more nodes depending on your input, all of this requires dynamic allocation as opposed to static allocation inside your methods. Dynamic allocation, you just, uh, in C, you say malloc, you tell how many, uh, what's the size of the object you want, and you get it. After you're done using it, you should do free. And that's what we were talking about in the previous lecture. If you want to do it in a lock-free manner, you have to worry a lot more than just do free. But if you, we're now in a crash course, we don't care about lock freedom, we just, uh, if you want to use memory and then reclaim it, do malloc and then do free in C and you're done. Uh, in Java, there is, uh, uh, you do a new, and you never free objects. There's no, there's no instruction to let you free objects because the, the system, the runtime, takes care of all these objects by itself. It collects them, it reclaims them when the program does not need them anymore. And that's called the garbage collector. The garbage collector is something that reclaims the objects without your knowledge, without your doing it by yourself. That's why it's automatic memory reclamation or automatic memory management as opposed to manual memory management where you have 
to do it yourself. You have to know when you don't need the object anymore and you have to free it, otherwise it stays forever in the memory. So this is automatic, dynamic. Dynamic is that you allocate stuff and free them on the heap. And automatic is that the garbage collection free it. You do not need to free the object. Okay, excellent. So what's the difference? Um, in the manual reclamation scheme, even forget about lock freedom. Remember, we don't care about it now. Uh, the lots of problems with the debugging. And you see there are memory leaks and daggling pointers. Memory leaks is when you forget to free stuff and then the memory just becomes larger and larger. And dangling pointer is the when you free too early and then someone else is still using the object, but you freed it, so the allocator gives it again to someone else, and this object is now being used by one component of the system to do one thing and by another component of the system to do something else. And after some time, this becomes a crash, which is really hard to debug. I mean, there's a crash, you don't know why it happened, there's, there's some place in the memory with someone writing integers to, another writing characters to. Eventually it crashes and it's, it's, this has been considered the bug of the 80s. And, uh, and then Java came out and people just moved to garbage collection. It was like... Uh, so if you... Um, let's jump. If you look at the languages that support garbage collection, Recently, you'll see that basically most of the languages that come out today, they support garbage collection and this uh, terrible bug that you have programmers like you spent days and weeks to try to find where is this dangling pointer coming from. Well, I have a crash. I don't know even that it comes from the memory management. I don't know anything about it. It was, it was a nightmare. You did not want to have it. And so... Basically, most of the new languages support uh, garbage collection. So, um, how does garbage collection know that it can reclaim object? Uh, to know exactly when an object will not be used anymore is undecidable, it's not possible to do. Uh, if you learn theory, uh, computational complexity, and undecidability, you can prove that you cannot tell. There's no automatic way to tell if at a specific point an object will not be used anymore. So that's not possible, but we're using some um, conservative approximation, which works excellently in practice. The way we do it, we say um, the program has some pointers in its local variables, in its stack, and these pointers point to the heap, and through these pointers I can go through a, a chain of pointers and get to objects. And there are lots of objects that I can access, but there are objects that I cannot access. There is no chain of pointers that could get me to these pointers. So if an object is not accessible by a chain of pointers from my local variables, from my roots, or from the global variables, static variables, anything that I can access directly, then this object is not going to be used anymore. If it's going, not going to be used anymore, then I can reclaim it without any problem. And uh, so, uh, this is uh, considered a very good thing, as I said. Software engineering, it's a lot easier if you don't have to account for everything. Each component is using and know when it's gone. Um, and it solves all these terrible bugs that we used to have. Uh, you have to do it properly because the memory is the bottleneck of the computation. If you don't do it properly, then it's going to slow your program, program severely. Uh, there are lots of optimizations, we're not going to touch any of them uh, right now. Uh, if you look at efficiency of garbage collectors, so you ask how slower your program runs because you're doing this memory management, this is the most obvious thing, the overall overhead, like program throughput. But it's also important to ask how, what's the length of your pause. So if the garbage collection kicks in and then the system stops responding, you know, if you're Amazon, people are going to give up buying a book or something else and they're going to give to go to your competitors. Pauses are seriously taken by the industry. If you want to do a garbage collection, and there are lots of techniques today to make the pauses small. This is also going to be very important for us because we want stuff to be lock-free. So we want to limit the time the garbage collection is working in between operations. We don't want to be blocked by the garbage collection. 
Um, it's very serious. So I could tell you stories about how companies, uh, um, IBM al almost lost uh, a contract for hardware and software for 50 or $500 million. For me, it's the same. I cannot tell the difference. But for these companies, it, it was a very big sell that they almost lost. And then we helped them um, make the pauses shorter and the, the sell went through. It was really important for them. So this is really something important. Space overhead. So, you know, if, if you need one mega and I take a giga to serve that, it's really easy for the memory manager, but it's not good for you. So this is another thing that um, you can look at. And locality of cache, there are theoretical proof that you cannot place the objects on, in the memory in an optimal manner for your cache. You cannot even get close, theoretically. This is really nice. So you want to place objects so that uh, there will be as few cache misses as possible. Theoretically, you cannot do this. So there are lots of work on various aspects of what's important for the memory manager. Um, there are three classical algorithms. We're going to talk briefly about reference counting, about mark and sweep, and it's a J, like uh, accompanied mark compact. Uh, we'll give up copying because it's a fast course. Um, and before we start, I just want to tell you that whenever you uh, allocate an object in the memory, it doesn't matter if it's manual or automatic, if you do malloc or you do new, the, you allocate 24 bytes, the system is going to take more. There's going to be a header to the object that you're never going to access. It's hidden from you, but it's there, and it's helping the uh, memory manager to handle this object, to understand what it is used for, when it is. So, for example, if it's an object, you need to know the methods of the class that uh, was used to create it. There's always a header there which you do not know about as a programmer, but it's there. So you allocate 24 bytes, there will probably be a lot more allocated in the memory for you. So there are headers, and let's start with reference counting. We want to know if an object is reachable from local pointers that we have. The easiest way to tell that an object is not reachable is if there is no pointer pointing at it at all. So if nothing is pointing to an object, certainly the program cannot access it. And reference counting just checks how many references point to a specific object. So for each object, we keep uh, a reference count field in the header uh, where you don't see it. And when nothing, when it goes down to zero, uh, then we know this object can be reclaimed. This is how it works whenever we change a pointer. So we have a pointer pointing to 01. And then we say p equals 02. Then we're going to decrement the pointer of 01, increment, the, sorry, the reference count of 01, increment the reference count of 02 to account for the change in reference counts. And then we actually are going to move the pointer. Now, if the reference count becomes zero, we know that we can reclaim this thing. It's not being accessible by the programs. It cannot be accessed anymore by the program. So we delete it. Once we delete O1, it may have pointed objects, other objects that are pointed by it. And so we have to decrement the reference count to each children recursively. And when we decrement these reference count, maybe the children have reference count zero and we have to reclaim that. And that goes recursively. So you know, one switch of a pointer, you may find out that there is a full structure that you are reclaiming. So in programs ref use, that, that, that use reference counting, sometimes you change a pointer and it takes forever. It happens seldom, but this is not that the computer is freezing. It's just that the reference counting is reclaiming all the stuff that is not reachable anymore. OK. So this is reference counting. Um, reference counting cannot reclaim cycles. So if, uh, if you have you know, two nodes each pointing to each other and they're not accessible from anywhere, they will still have reference count one, each of them. So uh, you will never be able to see that they are decremented to zero. Still, they need to be reclaimed, but reference counting cannot reclaim them. There, of course, could be larger, uh, you know, groups of objects that reference each other and then they will never go down to zero, even if they're not accessible by the program. So, uh, 
you know, you could go to various solutions. Basically, there are dedicated solutions, or you can say, I don't want to solve it. It will be okay. Some people do that too. And you could run a tracing algorithm, which we're now going to do, and they can reclaim cycles. And you can do it, you know, when you've reclaimed a lot of objects with the reference counting, and now you cannot reclaim anymore. You can move to a different algorithm and reclaim all the cycles. So these are uh, uh, the problems for uh, reference counting. If you want to do it in a parallel, in concurrent world, there are additional complicated problems that are not easy to note. And uh, I've not brought, I did not bring them here because we're not going to do reference counting. But after you work for a while and notice the problems, I can tell you that you can work farther and solve them. So we know how to solve these problems. But it took, you know, 10 years to solve them. And initially it was thought of as an inherent problem of reference counting. I'm not talking about all this, but you should know that for in the concurrent world, this exists. There are problems complicated, there are solutions complicated that needs to be run with reference counting. So the mark and sweep algorithm is the second thing that I'm going to mention, and it is uh, maybe the most popular thing running today on uh, Java virtual machines in all production systems in a more complicated form. Uh, we're going to talk about it, and this is also what we're going to use eventually for lock-free uh, solutions. Uh, what does mark and sweep do? In the mark phase, uh, you start from all the pointers that the program can access locally, and you recursively mark anything that's accessible from these pointers. So you mark anything that the program can access directly from its variables or by a path of pointers in the heap. So you mark this, and once you have everything marked, you can go over the heap, and anything that you haven't marked can be reclaimed. It's not accessible by the program. The program is not going to use it, and so you can reclaim it. There's no problem. This is mark and sweep. So here are the roots. This is the, the, these uh, references that the program can directly access are called roots in this community. So these are the roots. You can think of your registers. You can think of all the pointers in your runtime stack. You can think of global variables. You can think of static variables in classes if you're in Java. All of these are considered roots. They depend on the system you're working on. Uh, usually we abstract them by calling them roots. You go from the roots to all that is accessible in the heap, you mark it. Here it is black. And then you know that whatever is not marked, you can reclaim. It's not used and it's not going to be used by anybody. Um, questions about mark sweep? Okay. Um, how, how does it happen? I mean, in real life? You go to the new function, you want a new object, and there is some free list that holds all the free objects, and you want to access it, but you see that there is no object you can, there's no space for allocation, and so then you call mark sweep. So the garbage collection is initiated by your just allocating an object. You allocate an object, garbage collection kicks in if it's necessary. And of course, if after you run the garbage collection, there is still no space to allocate, you should tell the user you've gone out of space. There's no place to allocate. <clears throat> OK. So if, uh, if Mark and Sweep solve the, uh, the situation, you can now get uh, to allocate the objects and return the pointer to the user. You've done the new. Questions about this? Um General mark sweep scheme. Okay. Um, do you want me to go over the code? Who wants me to go over the code? Okay, we have a volunteer. Excellent. So uh, when the allocation calls mark sweep, you go over all the pointers in the root and you mark them. Um, you 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 mark them as you want to say these are accessible, and this marking is. Uh, uh, recursive routine, what it does, it looks at the object, and if it's not yet marked, it, go, it, it marks it, and then it goes to all the objects that are pointed by these objects and recursively mark them. This means it will check if the child is marked, 
If it's not marked, it's going to mark it and goes to its children and so forth. And uh, this recursively is going to get to all the objects that are accessible from the root. So you start by marking each pointer accessible from the root, and this recursively goes through all the objects that are accessible. And sweep, you just go from the heap bottom and you check if an object is marked. If it's marked, then you don't do anything. If it's not marked, you can add it to the free list. It's reclaimed, you can use it again. So this is mark uh, sweep, basic algorithm. Yeah. No, this, right now we're not talking about concurrency. This is just the basic algorithms. This was done, you know, in, it was invented in the 60s. And um, it was run many times only on sequential things. Um, I think maybe in the 80s or 90s they start. Of course, in Java, they had uh, many threads. You know, maybe in the beginning when Java came out, 95 maybe, it still had, I think, garbage collector that would stop all the program, run one thread that would do this thing, and then let the program continue in parallel. So, but, but today we know how to do it in parallel, and I'm going to talk about it later. Okay. More questions? Mark sweep? Okay. So this is Mark sweep, and the properties are that, um, first, it's, it's very basic, popular. It's doable in, in various kind of systems. It's... Uh, uh, it's, it's widely used, it's very simple. The problem is, one of the problem is, one of the good things is that you don't move objects, so there are no complications of moving objects while the program is uh, running, uh, but, um, but the heap may be fragmented. So if you don't move objects, you allocate and free, allocate and free, allocate and free, you get holes between objects, and then there is what is called fragmentation. Comes a big object. If you accumulate all the free space in the, in the heap, you can allocate it, but there's no specific place you can put it. This is called fragmentation, and it has to be handled. We'll soon talk about it. Um, in terms of complexity, mark phase goes over the live objects, and it seems smaller, like faster, than the second stage that goes over the whole heap. But in fact, because of the cache access, mark is going randomly in the memory, whereas sweep is going uh, very orderly on the memory. Mark is going to have lots of cache misses, and it's going to take maybe 80% of the time of the garbage collector. OK, so termination is simply, you know, you do a depth first search. Each edge is touched only once. You know that it's going to terminate and there are lots of engineering tricks that I could talk forever uh, about how it can be done better, and there are algorithmic advances that make it uh, as good as it is today when you get it in your Java virtual machine or C Sharp or whatever you're using. So uh, uh, if the heap gets, uh, if the heaps get fragmented, so you have all these red objects and between them yellow spaces that are not used, now, if you have to allocate something large, you're going to have a problem, and therefore there is the mark compact algorithm. So it starts by marking all the objects that are alive, say the red objects, and then you need to move them in order to free consecutive space that you can use for allocation. So um, if I want to move all the objects, it's very easy. The first object moves to address zero, and if the first object has length 100 bytes, then the second object should move to address 100. And if the second object is 75 bytes, then the third object should move to address 175. Each object moves to the accumulated size of the objects before it. And so it's very easy to move. And uh, you need a minute to think to understand that you've not completed your job when you've moved all the objects. Because when you've moved all the objects, all the pointers in the heap are not correct anymore. So a second part of compaction is to fix all the pointers to point to the new locations. And this takes half of the time. So half of the time you move the objects, half of the time you fix all the pointers in the heap. 
which is these are the challenges for compaction. Um, it's usually very uh, inefficient. You don't use it. You, you, like you do the mark and sweep maybe 10, 20 times, and then you do once more compact. You don't want to do it all the time because it's a lot more expensive to start doing all these moves of objects and fixing of pointers. So more compact is considered uh, more costly. Um, let's do a simple example, the simplest maybe compactor that we have, and also a very good one. Uh, it's called the compressor. Um, so, and, and a very simplistic presentation of it, it's, it's a bit more involved. But what you do there is you go over the hip, so you go over this, and each time you get to uh, an object, you compute where it should move. You can easily compute it because it's the sum of all the objects, sum of spaces of all the previous objects that you've seen. You move it and you record in a separate table, there is a hash table, where you say the object at address 50 was moved to zero. The object at address 1075 was moved to address 150 and so forth. You keep this table on the size that, uh, like a hash table, that tells you for each object where it moves to. This is what you do in the first pass over the heap. You just go over all the objects and you tell yourself, you write in a separate table where each object goes. Then you do a second pass over the heap and now you actually move the objects and fix the pointers. For each object, you move it to where it should go and then for each pointer in the object, you look at your table and you say, this pointed to 175, now it should point to 150. So you fix all the pointers in the object that you move. Once you've gone through the heap and moved the object, fixed their pointers, you're done. You have a, a compacted heap. Okay, so this is called the compressor. Uh, <clears throat> at the end, you go over the roots, all the things outside the heap that point inside the heap, and you fix them too you have this table that helps you. Questions about compaction? Yeah. <coughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. So what you want is uh, uh, like something that tries to move objects smartly so that it will save cache misses later. So if the things that are going to be accessed one after the other, they should live on the same cache line or at least close to each other. The lots of work on that. Um, yeah, I mean, there is a... I'm teaching this course, if you happen to be in the technique, not, well, um, if you happen to be in the technion, so one of the, there is a full hour talking about that. Um, I've also worked about it a lot and, and there is also a proof, uh, theoretical proof that you cannot do it optimally. So um, this, is, uh, this is something that has been worked on a lot. Interesting, it's very, very difficult to do. So you cannot gain a lot from this. Uh, except for these specific things that you said, if you know you have a data structure, this becomes a lot easier. You can place the data structure close nodes close to each other, and then it improves performance. Yes, and these things have been done. Yes. Uh, okay. So. Uh, uh, okay. There is a question. Why can't we do it all in a single pass? So. What I said, we're going, let's see if anyone can say why. I went through all the heap and computed in a separate table uh, where each object moves. And in a second heap pass, so I go over the heap twice, in a second heap pass, I move the objects and fix the pointers. Why can I not do it in one heap pass? Just simply save time. Can anyone say what, yeah? Right, exactly. If I go the first pass, I know where the object that I'm looking at is moving, but I don't know if it points to this object. I have no idea how to fix the pointer. So this pointer points to there, and you know I have to fix it somewhere. 
I don't have the information on where this pointer is going to need to be fixed. So uh, I need to, to go twice over the hip if I want to fix the pointers. So I go over all and write to myself where everybody is moving, and then I move them and fix all the pointers inside them. Um, okay, we could ask more questions, but uh, uh, this is uh, uh, good. So uh, in the full compressor, if you look at the paper, there are like a very sophisticated table that keeps the pointers and, uh, and they talk about uh, the first pass can be done very quickly to just compute these addresses and, and of course parallelization. What do you do if there are several threads that try to compact the heap together or you try to do it while the program is working? There are various ways to deal with it. And this is, uh, so I'm, I'm just giving a simple version uh, of the compressor. Um, in general, uh, you could ask various things about Mark Compact. There is the question, you asked if I can uh, order the objects in a, in a clever way to make the cache misses behave nicely. And the answer is yes, but it's difficult and you don't gain a lot. On the other hand, if you behave in a stupid way, so you take a very fast compaction algorithm that just doesn't care about the order of object and just puts them randomly in the heap, then it's a really blow to the efficiency of the program. Uh, we've tried it with real Java benchmarks and you just you lose 30-40% of the runtime if you just mix randomly uh, the order of objects in order to make all of this uh, run faster. So uh, you do have to try to maintain the original order of objects of a program. It seems that uh, the program allocates objects in the same order that it's going to access them. So if you keep the order of the program, you'll be okay. If you randomly mix order of objects, you're going to be in a really bad shape. If you try to improve, you can do, but not a lot. This is about the order. Um, okay, so I'll go fast through that. Uh, is, is more compact clear? I mean, what's happening? How you do it in a simplified manner? Excellent. So I jump over copying. Um, and uh, just to say reference counting, if you look at uh, a very simplistic uh, uh, comparison, you have uh, reference counting has kind of a complexity which depends on the dead objects because you have to traverse all the dead objects and reclaim them. And you have to look at all the pointer updates and change the reference count. Whereas mark sweep, uh, goes by the size of the heap, so it's really different. And in some cases, you may prefer to use reference counting, but in most cases, people use mark sweep because in most cases, it is more efficient and also dealing with cycles is a bothering thing. And also, parallelism is more difficult with reference counting. So mark and sweep is, is the method that rules the world today, mostly. Okay, so now um, we want to work with parallel code. What do we do? Uh, instead of looking at the text, let's look at this picture. Um, the, uh, the, there are like four cores on the machine that's depicted here, and time goes this way. So, and, and the program is marked in, in um, orange, and the garbage collection work is marked in blue. So what you see in the first uh, drawing is, is called Stop the World Garbage Collector. This was what was used in Java in the beginning, and it was really inefficient. What would happen? The program runs you know, on four cores concurrently in parallel, and then it is all stopped, and the garbage collector kicks in, and it only works on a single core without any parallelization, and all the other cores are idle. This was very inefficient, and after a while, uh, Parallel stopped the world, was, uh, they began to use it. And there you just take the garbage collector and parallelize it. This is called Parallel Stop the World Collector. And uh, this, is, uh, this is not easy to do, but it's not very complicated. It's, uh, it was done. Uh, another way to go, this was uh, started in the day that you had only a single core. 
is to say, let's let the program thread once in a while do collection work. So when you get to allocating an object, you spend some of your time, so you allocate the objects, but then you say, I, I tax my time, I spend some time helping the collection. So incrementally, I'm going and doing the collection in all, like between my operation. Whenever I allocate, I help the collection a bit. This is called incremental collection. And then people started thinking of concurrent garbage collection. And here what you see is, is that the collection runs concurrently to the program. So the program goes on running on most of the cores, and in one core, there is a thread that's reclaiming all the space. So this is the most non-intrusive way to do garbage collection, like the program does not fill, the pauses are really small. Um, this could uh, be maybe 10 milliseconds. So you have to stop all the threads in order to make sure that they're all synchronized with the garbage collector, and it runs. Uh, but this thing is not an easy thing to design. I'll get back to that soon. And on the fly is the most complicated. So here, there's like, uh, you never stop all the threads together, which is complicated. What you do is you let each thread tell you that it knows that the garbage collection is starting. And sometimes threads need to scan which objects are accessible from their roots, from their local stacks. So this is, this is the little blue things here. After all the threads have responded, you can start the garbage collection in concurrently with the other threads. Okay, so this is on the fly. So we have all these various things on a parallel processor. And soon I will talk about what we need for lock freedom. But these things are used. So for example, the, if, you, if you take a Java virtual machine, uh, sometimes it will ask you, do you want to be very efficient or do you want to have short pauses? So if you are interested in serving clients and you don't want them to, to have a pause while they're executing a transaction, you will say, for me, it's most important to have short pauses. And then Java will go to this, uh, this kind of collector. There's a short pause here. And this thing, the fact that the collector runs together with the program is going to reduce the throughput. There's going to be a toll on the program. We'll discuss that soon. But you're willing to suffer maybe 10% loss in the throughput so that the reduction, so that the short pauses are reduced maybe from a second to 10, millis 10 milliseconds or one millisecond. Um, between those, on the fly is never used. So it was once used on a production system uh, in IBM uh, while I was working there. And, you know, there, we were a bunch of researchers who implemented this. And then at some point we finished implementing this and we delivered it to the production guys. And <laughs> They, it was impossible for them to handle this. So whenever Java uh, brought up a new feature in Java and the garbage collector had to be fixed to work with the new feature, they kind of were not able to, to change anything. This is very complicated, the on-the-fly collector. That's the only reason not to use it, and it is the reason why it is never, you will never find it in a production system after that one was in the beginning of the 90s in IBM. Uh, usually people use concurrent, the concurrent version, it could be a lot simpler, in order to um, get small, short pauses, and it is important. And if you don't care about po short pauses, if you're a, a bank and you're running during the night all your transactions, there's no clients looking, you just want to do a lot of things fast, then you would uh, do the parallel stop the world, and you don't care about the pauses, it will be the fastest in terms of throughput. So this is how it looks in the parallel world. And uh, uh, for concurrent GCs, um, the, the good thing is that we can keep the program running, but the bad thing is that it becomes complicated because what happens is we are trying to traverse this heap, right? We are doing a depth first search on this graph of objects and there are links between the objects the problem is that the graph is not fixed. While we're working together with the program, the program changes pointers, and the graph that we look at is changing. And this is very, very difficult to... It's impossible 
to traverse a graph if the links are changing.